has one array of memories, and this machine has three arrays. And I just update each of the three arrays with every move of the old machine. And I could do this even if there were 20 tapes, the same way. Now what happens if I get the dot gets up to this dollar sign, and then this machine tells me I'm supposed to write a symbol? Yeah, I got to shift everything over. Shifting things over in Turing machines is like bread and butter. You got to write a Turing machine to do that. I mean, it's just like you're always shifting stuff over. You always need more room. And, and you don't have any room to do anything because you're in one dimension land. So it's always moving things over and making room for yourself. Don't get involved too much with those details or think, oh, that makes something harder. It doesn't. You just have to do it a lot. You have to shift a lot. All right, so K tapes are the same. If I wrote this up formally, it would be a page long with a lot of complex technical details. And I'm pretty sure our book has a formal proof of the K tape. Does it? Yeah. For sure, it has this. So you can look this up and, and it's not, look, it is not worthwhile ever for me to show you that formal proof in a lecture. But it is worthwhile one on one and it's certainly worthwhile you with the book. It's worthwhile to read these things and see the difference between somebody standing in front of a class and kind of having a discussion until you believe that something's true and really, really checking that it's really true. There's nothing I said today that you should be convinced is completely true just based on my arguments. The only the reason you should believe anything is because we're making some convincing dialogue and you trust me. And there's a big difference between that and proof. But at the same time, you've got to have a good sense before you prove anything. So, Next one. Non-determinism. This is a really important one. This is the one that's at the heart of the P equals NP question. Non-determinism, thank goodness, in this class, you know what it is, so I don't have to take like a two-hour time out to explain the idea. Non-determinism just means you got transitions coming out of a state, and you don't know which one to pick. You know, the symbol says zero, write a one, go to the right. The symbol says zero, write a zero, go to the left. Which one do I do? It gives your machine some power. You have choices. And you can take any one of them, and as long as they get to final configurations, you accept. It gives your machine power, at least convenience, to have that. But does it really accept anything more than it used to? And the answer is no. So let's try to figure out how we could simulate a machine that's non-deterministic with a machine that's deterministic. And this really needs a, a careful thought. And uh, I think we'll do this example, and then we'll we'll quit for today. We got a lot more we need to do before we get into this whole theory, but this is a good stopping point. So let's talk about non-determinism, get this down, and, and quit for today. Okay, let's think before I write down a solution or describe anything to you. You've got a machine now, let's say that, uh, that can make at most, let, let's say the, the state that has the most choices is, is a state that has four choices. But one of the states is going to have the most choices. There's some, some finite number. So let's say it's 4. It could be anything. It could be k, but, but 4 is good enough. Now, I've got a machine now that only lets me have one choice on a state. How can I simulate that machine that has four choices with my machine that has one choice? This is really a tall order. Yeah, do you have an idea? Can we copy your input string four times and, have, and run it in series? We could, but that's not enough. We would, and then we would represent that state with four choices, with one choice being in this part of the series of the computation, choice two being in this part of this computation, choice three. Yeah, so, so Chris's I, you're definitely on the right track. Chris's idea is to take the input and kind of run lots of different choices through it. But let, let me back up again and, and give a big picture, because there's going to be a, a mild flow with that idea, but it's the right direction. Yeah, Joe, you have a continuation? Send it to a subroutine, set a flag, and then send it down four states. Put four new states in a subroutine. Send it to the subroutine, set a flag, and send it down to the state that the flag is. You say you, have it, you want to make it determinate, so that you have to... You want to make it deterministic, right. So you put four states in to simulate the four different paths you can take, right? Okay. And they're, they're looking for a particular flag. Send it to a subroutine that's going to determine what state you're going to be going to. 
what state is the right state to be heading to. You set a flag, and then you go down to those four states. Mm -hmm. and the flag but, but you don't know the right state you're supposed to be going to. You have to really try them all. I mean, there's no way to know. There's no subroutine that can check that for you before you actually do it. You have to really try all of them. Um, I mean, yeah, Chris, you have an idea? If, if, you could, if you could write a machine that for, for every, single possible, every single combination of choices, yeah. try them all, and if any of them came up as a, in an accept state, you win. If you can do all that in one Turing machine, then you're set, right? Yes. Or it's all ordered together. Yes. And you can't do all yes. that. Yes. Yes. That's a that's it's a very good idea. Uh, let's follow that a little further. See this little dot? That represents a configuration of my non-deterministic Turing machine. Now, remember what a configuration is? It's a it's a picture of the tape with the state in the right place, and what state it is. So that's a picture of my my non-deterministic Turing machine. Now, what does a regular deterministic Turing machine look like in this picture? Here's a configuration. What's the next thing going to look like? Another configuration. Another configuration. Another configuration. And it goes and goes and goes. And sooner or later, either it says yes or it says no or it goes forever. Computations on deterministic Turing machines look like a long line of configurations. Very boring. What does a, what does a computation look like on a non-deterministic Turing machine? It's a tree. There's lots of choices at each stage. One, two, three, four. Let's say maximum four, like, like Chris was saying. One, two, three, four. And now each of these presumably could have four. Etc. This is sometimes called a computation tree. It doesn't re represent any particular computation in the non-deterministic machine. It represents all the possible things it could do. Let's turn this non-deterministic machine simulation for a moment into a graph question, because I, I made this tree now. How would you decide whether this non-deterministic machine accepts something? At the bottom here, of this tree. Actually, some of these things might go down forever. This, this could be infinite, this computation tree. But at the bottom, if you're ever going to accept, there might be some final states, some acceptance states. If there is a path from the start configuration to any state that accepts, then you accept that input string. And the sequence of choices that get you from the start to that acceptance state is the path that you should take in your machine. Because that's what non-determinism means. Like Chris was saying, it's ors. If any one of these, or that, or that, or that, gets you to an end, you accept. So what we really like to do is figure out whether this non-deterministic machine tree representation has a path from the root to an accepting state. How do you do something like that? We're back in algorithms now. Forget about Turing machines for a second. Somebody gives you a description of a tree that's built this way. It's called a non-deterministic machine. But you could generate the tree from that machine. You could store it in a data structure. You could build it as deep as you want. I could have given it to you as an assignment. Here's a bunch of finite states. They say what you're supposed to do on these symbols. Build me a tree of configurations. And what are you supposed to do to determine whether you accept or not? You're supposed to go ahead and find out whether there's a path from the top to a leaf that's an accepting thing. That's just a traversal of this tree. Looking from the top, looking for an accepting state. Well, yeah, the tree can be infinitely deep, so even if there is The tree can be infinitely deep, so what kind of search should we do? Some kind of a breadth first search. Certainly not a nice depth first search. <laughs> Let's do a depth first search. Dum -da -dum -da -dum -dum. Uh, one day I'll come back. As soon as I hit an end, I'll just, I'm out. I'm going to backtrack, Mom! I mean, it's like, you never come back, right? You can't do a depth first search. You've got to do a breadth first search. All right, so that's fine. So I can say you have a computer. Uh, go do a breadth first search on this tree, and now you're convinced that your computer, your, your Linux workstations in the other room can simulate a non-deterministic Turing machine. Right, but that doesn't mean that a deterministic Turing machine really can. Well, if you believe me, it can. But let's thought, think about how to do this with a deterministic Turing machine. OK? Here's what we're going to do. Let's make a little room. Your programs can, so a deterministic Turing machine can too. Let's see how it's going to do it. <laughs> 